Shalom and blessed morning, brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. We can gather this morning again online to worship God and to hear the Word of God. Praise the Lord that I'm given this opportunity to share the Word of God with all of you. Especially, I want to give thanks to God for Pastor Joshua, Pastor Jason, and all the pastoral and leadership team for giving me this opportunity. So this morning, we are going to reflect on the Word of God and we are going to ponder and meditate on God's Word. May the Holy Spirit speak to all of us. May the Word of God bring encouragement to us and may the Word of God bring transformation to our lives. So when I was preparing for this Sunday's message, I had a question that was ringing in my heart. It is a question that God wants to ask all of us. What is God's dream for all of us? As an individual, as a church, what is God's dream for you? What is God's dream for me? Surely I know that many of us, we have our own dreams that we pursue. You know, maybe everyone has a personal dream or some ambition that you may be pursuing. But I'm not referring to that personal dream or personal ambition that you are pursuing. What the question that I have here that I felt that God has put in my heart is that, what is truly God's dream for all of us? When God has redeemed us from the kingdom of darkness, why did God pay such a high price? I'm not talking about the small dreams that we have in all our personal lives. You know, some small dreams, you and I, we hope to achieve this and we hope to achieve that. Why is it important that we must know God's dream for us? Because brothers and sisters, as we are living in these last days, as we can witness, as we are going through a global pandemic and all the things that are going on, we know from the scriptures that all that can be shaken will be shaken, but that which cannot be shaken will remain. So surely God's dream for you, for, for myself, for all of us, God's dream will remain. But if we choose to only pursue our own dreams, could it be that we will end up as foolish people pursuing something that can be shaken, that at the end of the day, it amounts to nothing and it will be shaken and it will all crumble. Let's reflect on this great salvation that all of us have. It's, it will become easier if I make a comparison. I, I, for example, an illustration, we know that in the Bible, our salvation is described as a redemption. We have been redeemed through the precious blood of Jesus. Our redemption was paid through the precious blood of Jesus. When we say redemption, we know there is all this pawn shop, right? The concept of redeeming or probably in a banking transaction, when you charge your house to get a bank loan and when you have paid the loan, you redeem the house. The house now belongs to you instead of the bank. Maybe by giving such a comparison, you may be and you, are, you may find it difficult to relate to such an example. Let's put it into a more personal, uh, with a human touch. For example, let's say we hear of a story where a child is being kidnapped. You, this is a very scary thing. If we hear of a, we read about news of children being kidnapped. And for example, we watch this in movies as well. If a child is being kidnapped, the kidnappers will set a ransom sum, right? Pay this by this date, by midnight, pay two million into this bank account and you will get your child back. When we give such an illustration, when we compare it with such an illustration, suddenly redemption plays a different uh, a different role. It is meant to save a child's life. When you have paid the two million, that is the ransom money to get back the child that has been kidnapped. But a logical parent, a good and reasonable thinking parent, after rescuing the child, after paying for the ransom money, do you think that parent will once again allow the children to go and 
For example, if, it, if the kidnapper is known, the identity of the kidnapper is known, would you allow your child to play with the kidnapper again? Would you allow your child to work with the kidnapper or work for the kidnapper? Obviously, the answer is no. We wouldn't allow a child that has been kidnapped to return to the kidnapper to work for him or her or work, or work with him or her. That would be a nonsensical thing to do. It definitely, we would not do such a thing. But as a child of God, we have been redeemed from the kingdom of darkness into God's kingdom of the marvelous light of God. Do you think that God would want us to return to the domain of darkness of the enemy? Definitely no. So when God rescued us, He has a dream for each one of us. By redeeming us, by rescuing us, it is one of His acts of love. It, is a, it forms one of His dream for each one of us. By redeeming us, it is just a step of restoring us and putting into motion everything so that His dream for us can be fulfilled. Amen, brothers and sisters. I hope you can follow me. Uh, you begin to catch what I'm trying to uh, share here. So I'm in, a, in this short sharing this morning, I'm going to share with you three simple principles so that as we reflect on our lives, we can align our lives or realign our lives, rebuild our lives with God's dream for us. It is very important in such times that we live in today. We should know, are we building our lives according to God's dream? Are we aligning our lives in line and consistent with God's dream for you and me? Otherwise, we will be building everything in vain and it will all come to become a meaningless pursuit in life. So firstly, I would like to read a few verses with you from the epistle of Colossians. If you have your Bible with you, maybe you can read with me and I'm going to flash these verses on the screen. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, we read, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So in these three verses, we can see that the central focus of these three verses is God himself. Even though this, is very, this sounds very basic to all of us, but I would like to invite you to ponder for a moment with me these few verses. It says and it tells us that all things were, that are created in heaven, that are on earth, whether visible or whether invisible, all these things were created through him. Maybe you were not in agreement with me. You will say, of course, of course, I believe everything, whether seen or unseen, are created through God. All this we know. But watch the following few words. He said, all these things, including you and me, yes, you agree that we are created by God, but have we ever considered and thought that we are also created for God, for Him? The reason He created us is for Himself. He, his dream is that we can ultimately return to his original dream, original intention of creating us. That is, you and I, we are created for God. There may be many things that compete for the attention, compete with God, that also stake a claim over our lives. 
many forces, many voices, many distractions. They also want a piece of our life. But from the verse that we read just now, very clearly it has been laid out for us in the scriptures that you and I are created for God. This preposition for Him, it gives us completely a different dimension for us to think and to meditate on. We know that we are created by God, but have you ever come to the realization and the awakening that we are created for Him? All that we do, all that we function on this earth is ultimately for Him. So the first thing, the first principle that I want to share concerning aligning our lives or rebuilding our lives with the dream of God is to question and to ask ourselves whether we have truly included God in our lives as the main thing. Why do I say that? Many Christians today, I'm being very uh, honest and frank about this, my frank and honest assessment, many Christians today only have God, include God in their life as an accessory. You know, like a car accessory. You put some accessory, yeah? you make the car beautiful, maybe you add this thing, you add a sticker, you add a spe- uh, an additional lamp here. Without it, you also the car will also function perfectly fine. So it is just an accessory uh, part that you put into the car. Similarly, Christians can fall into such a state where we only use God, where you, we only take God as an accessory, not as the main thing. When you and I, we do that, we begin to run inconsistent with the verses we read just now. If you and I are created for God, we cannot have God just as an accessory. He must be the main thing in our lives. He must be the focus of our lives, of everything we do, of everything we live. What we think, what we speak, what we do, the main focus has to be God. Otherwise, we live outside the reality of the dream that God has for us. Like I said just now, If we are not building our lives on the dream that God has for us, in the times of shaking, all that can be shaken will be shaken. Only that which cannot be shaken will remain. So when you and I know that the first principle concerning God's dream for us has to do with Himself, we have to include God in all we do, in all our lives, then this takes on a different meaning to how we live our lives. The things that cause us to be anxious, the king things that cause us to be worried, or the things that trouble us. Have you ever have God in that picture? Does God, is God included in your planning? Or it is only you plan everything, and finally, after whatever you plan, you say, I commit it to God. No. We have to include God right from the beginning of our planning. Right from the beginning each day, we have to invite God, welcome God to be involved in our lives, to be included in our lives. That is what it means to have God as the main thing, to include God in all things. See, the Apostle Paul has a very good attitude about this. When he knows his life has to do with fulfilling God's dream for him. Look at what, how he lived his life according to this principle. Let's read together Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, on the screen we read together, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. 
I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In these three verses, Paul made it very clear. He knew God's dream for him. There is a goal in his life. He and his attitude in how he lived his life is in this manner. I only pursue, I only press on towards this dream. Am I right? We are not going to uh, go deep into these few verses, but let's look at what Paul said. He pressed on so that he may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of him. What is next that he said? He reached forward to those things. He pressed toward the goal, the dream, the prize of the upward call. God's dream for him. Why did God redeem him? He, that was his main thing. That was his motivation. And when you and I understand this, we can also adopt the same attitude that the Apostle Paul had. What do I mean by that? Before he said he pressed on, what did he say? He said, I forget. He said, firstly, he said, not that I have attained. He said, he's, he's aware. He was in a process. He was still in the journey. We got to understand our lives. We are living it in a journey, in a process, so that we understand it is not just, oh, why is it such a long thing? What am I going through? We must understand our life involves journey after journey in a huge journey. Amen. Our lives is a race. It's a journey. It involves many processes. So he said, it is not that I have attained. He acknowledged that his life, he keeps on living it as a process. He pursues toward it. The next thing he said before he talks about pressing on forward is he learned to forget. What, does, what did he say? He said he learned to forget those things which are behind in order for us to effectively live our lives to fulfill God's dream for us. Not our individual dreams, not our personal dreams or ambition. In order for us to do that, we must learn to forget, to begin to be able to differentiate. If these things do not help me in my pursuit of God's dream being fulfilled in my life, I must choose to forget them. I must choose to lay them aside. These things do not help me. Or in another verse that we read in, we, we can read in Hebrews chapter 12, right? In a race, we run in a race to pursue that goal, to press on towards the goal. We got to learn to set aside those things that easily entangle us. Those besetting sins. So there are sins that we got to learn to distinguish. These things cause me not to be able to have the dream of God fulfilled in my life. I must learn these things. I must forget these things. I must overcome. So brothers and sisters, there are things that we hold on to our lives. There are things that we cannot forget. But in the grand scheme of things, if we understand that God has a dream for each one of us, when we realize that, when we come to that awakening, we will then quickly learn to forget. We will quickly, quickly learn to set aside things that are not important, that has just the purpose of distracting us and truly press on towards God to include him, to have him as the main thing. Not just as and when I want God, I think about him, as and when I need him, I pray, and then I keep many other things, many other important things in my heart. In such a, if we live in such a way, when shaking comes, many of these things will be shaken, and our lives will be greatly shaken. But if we build and rebuild our lives on God's dream for all of us, then we will not only thrive, 
but we will be able to become like overcomers in times of shaking. So brothers and sisters, that's the first principle that we must contemplate, must think about, to include God, not as an accessory. He must be the main thing. We are created for Him. Amen. Hallelujah. So like I said, I'm going to share with you just three simple keys or simple principles for us to meditate and think and reflect about whether our lives, are we fulfilling God's dream? Whether we know God's dream for us or not. So the second principle that I would like to share with you this morning is, let's think again. I use the illustration of how that child was being kidnapped and then the money, the ransom money was being paid. In our case, what was the price that was paid? The Father God sent His one and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. For what? The life of Jesus was made the price, the ransom money that he was, he was being used to pay for our redemption, to rescue us. Why did Father God pay such a price? Not only He sent His one and only begotten Son to this world, His one and only begotten Son was sent to die a cruel death and then was raised on the third day so that He could take our place to die for our sins and He was raised from the dead so that everyone who believes in Him will receive eternal life. So if today you're listening to this, you're still wondering whether I should believe in Jesus or not, Take the right and wise decision. Decide to repent, to turn around from your, all your sin, from your wicked ways. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Invite Jesus into your heart. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. When you turn away from all those wicked things, that is what it means to repent. And then the blood of Jesus is used to wash you, to wash you, to cleanse you, to make you clean so that you can begin a new life in Jesus. Amen. So if you believe in him means you receive Jesus into your heart. Now he is your Lord and your Savior. So God the Father sent his one and only begotten son to become the price that he paid to, to redeem us. So my question is, why must the father pay such a great price? If we compare with the illustration of the kidnapped child, why, did, why, must, why would a parent pay millions of dollars, you, you ask? Then you will be telling me, hey, this is not a question. It's a given. A parent would definitely pay whatever the price because he wants to rescue their children. Am I right? That's right. So similarly, God was willing to pay that price because it's a no-brainer. God wanted to rescue his children. God wanted to save and redeem his children. Amen. But more than that, in these last days, we must begin to understand why God redeemed us when he sent his son to die on the cross for us. We must gain a deeper understanding Yes, to redeem his children. But let's look at the last book in the Bible. The last book begins to talk about another character. He speaks about the bride. Towards the end, you know that we are told before Jesus came, there was this cry being made. The spirit and the bride say, come. So what does it mean? If you ponder with me, then you will understand how huh, God the Father paid such a high price by sending His Son to this world to die for our sins. Why? To redeem a bride for His Son. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? That it was the dream of the Father. He did not just redeem, he did not just send his son to redeem us because we are his children. Truly, we are all rightfully his children. But he also wanted a bride for his son. And you and I, we live on this earth, we are called to be his bride. 
a child and a bride is totally different thing. From a child, we know we are the children of God, but we must continue our relationship to grow, to understand that we are also called to be the bride of Christ. That is the dream of the Father. If you don't, if you are not sure about this, think further with me. Follow me again. What will happen when the world comes to an end? In the last days, what is the thing that will happen in heaven? There will be a marriage supper of the Lamb. There is a climax. There is a marriage feast that will take place. For who? For Jesus, the bridegroom, and his bride that has been redeemed from the earth. So all of us, this invitation is given to everyone. Whether you want to receive this invitation to be his bride. What does a bride do? A bride loves her bridegroom. So a bride doesn't speak about a specific gender. In the Bible, bride speaks about both the male and the female, the children of God who has come to this relationship with God, who has come to know God and grown in their relationship to become a bride. It is an invitation open to all Christians, but it depends on us whether we want to receive this invitation, this call, and begin to live our lives consecrated as a bride to God. If you read the Bible, throughout the scripture, there is an underlying theme. All through the scripture, God has always intended for a bride for his son. Even from the Old Testament, we know that the, great, the greatest commandment, right? This was even repeated in the days of Jesus. They asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What is the great commandment? And Jesus summed it very well. Let's read together in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 verses 37 to 40. Jesus made it very clear. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So Jesus summed up all the commandments in the old covenant by just saying, to love God wholeheartedly and to love others. Hallelujah. Such a simple thing. Such a simple theme that, that runs throughout the Bible. Let us consider this in the light of the dream of the Father for us. The Father sent his son to redeem a bride. Like what I said, the bride loves the bridegroom. Amen. The first commandment is to love God wholeheartedly. Don't be mistaken. First commandment is the greatest commandment. A commandment is different from a commission. Okay? Many people they get confused. Their whole life is only about the great commission, but they forget about the great commandment. The great commandment ranks first. We are to love God first. Everyone's first call is to love God because God sent his son to redeem a bride. Many people get confused when we talk about loving God. We will be thinking, oh, I do a lot of things. I'm loving God. I do a lot. There. I serve God. I, 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 have, I do a lot of things externally or I give offering all these uh, to love God. Perhaps true, we, these are all expressions that we, we give and we do these things as an act of love for God. But I must say that all these are not necessarily the measurement of how, whether we love God or not. Let's just go back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verses 7 to 8. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. 
We go back to the original plan of God. God created man. He breathed into the nostril. Can you imagine? God went so close to man. God went so close to Adam. And he breathed into Adam. And when Adam opened up his eyes, the first face that he has ever seen is the face of the Father. If you understand science, this is what you know how people in the agricultural industry they understand the principle of imprinting. The first face that a baby animal, when they open up their eyes, they look at the first face, they will call that face, they will identify and recognize it as their parent. So this clearly tells us from the beginning, God created man, Adam and Eve, God created man to be able to relate to them. Amen. God wanted to be a father to Adam. God wanted to have a relationship with Adam. That is why every day God will come down into the garden. God placed man in the garden of Eden. Eden speaks of pleasure. Eden's meaning is pleasure. You see how God loves us. He created us. He puts us in a garden called pleasure. He's never out to harm us. His purpose is to love us, to put us in the garden of pleasure. He will come every day. He will walk with men. He will talk with men. There has always been the dream of God. He wanted to come and fellowship with the man that he has created. And he wanted men to also fellowship with him to love him as well. Amen. So that is the second principle that we must understand about God's dream for us. God sent his son to redeem a bride, a bride that loves God. And this loving God, like I say, is not merely about external acts of service. Many people have confused, you know, charitable words, things that we do. We announce to people this much I did, this much I paid. But in the Bible, we can learn a very quick lesson from a man after God's heart. Who is that? King David. He is known as the sweet singer of Israel, right? He wrote so many psalms. But he was also known as the man after God's heart. Why? He has such a close relationship with God and he knew God and his ways. And one who knows God and has a relationship with God is one who loves God. And what was his main thing? Was it to do great things for God? No. He said, this is the one thing I pursue in life, just to dwell in the presence of God, in the temple, just to behold his beauty. Isn't this a clue to us to understand what it means to love God? If you and I cannot just stay in a place, we cannot spend time, to find a place to just spend time loving God, and we can be busy in a church doing many things, can we see the inconsistency? We can do many things outwardly, but we cannot dwell just even for 10 minutes doing nothing but loving God like David would have done in the temple, just beholding his face, just beholding his glory. Just loving the word of God, meditating his word. So brothers and sisters, external activities are not conclusive evidence of our love for God. Saul, before he became Paul, he thought he was loving his God. In fact, he showed his zealous love for God by persecuting the church. So sometimes many people can say that they love God, but they are doing the things that God never asked them to do. And they could not even spend time with God. They've never even spent time to read the word of God, to love God, to worship God, just all by themselves. Brothers and sisters, we need to come back to the simplicity of loving God. Because that is very primary in the heart of God, in the dream that God has for all of us. Let's look at another scripture, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. I just want to quickly read these five verses with you. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, 
proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unlo- unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. From such people, turn away. So here, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, made it very clear that in the last days, there will be people will become lovers of pleasures instead of lovers of of God, if we missed the dream of God for us, we will be pursuing pleasures. Isn't this already happening in our churches today? You know, the younger generation, they find the church to be boring. And then the church thinks that we need to crank up more programs to make them interested. We got to compete with the video games, with the movies that are so interesting that I, that could capture their attention. Isn't that right? Is it right? Let's consider for a while. We must we must capture. We must try our best so that they don't find the church to be bored. But the verse that we read just now it says, "Men will be lovers of pleasure instead of lovers of God." No. God is not against us having pleasure. We have said that very clearly. God puts when God created man, He placed us in the garden of pleasure. He He prepared pleasure for us. He called it a garden, garden of pleasure, Eden. But that pleasure in the original intention can only be find can only be found in Him. Anything outside God, any pleasure, whatever pleasure you can find outside God, is not true pleasure at all. Like what the psalmist said in Psalm 16. In Psalm 16, the psalmist said, "You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore." Did you read that? At the right hand of God are pleasures forevermore. It did not say that we have to come up with more activities, more creative ways. Nothing wrong if we have creative ways to reach out to people. That's very good. We make use of the gifts that God gives us. But in the Bible, we are taught that true pleasures are at the right hand of God. So, in fact, the focus of our churches today should actually be to restore, to ask God. To have His glory be restored in His church again, when the presence of God is in His church, when the glory of God is in His church again, then people will be attracted to the true pleasure. If you can crank up some nice things, well and good, but. The next moment, if the world can come up with even more exciting video games, we will lose out to them. We cannot be competing with them. So the church is not about getting more interesting programs to capture the younger generation. Our church should be burdened to pray for the younger generation not to be lovers of pleasure, but to be lovers. Of God, the church should be on bended knees, praying for the glory and the presence of God to be restored. Look at the church of Acts. People have people know God is in the church. Why? When God is in the church, truly people will be either very afraid or will be very af- attracted to it. The moment they light in the presence of God, boom, they fell dead. That is when the glory of God is being restored. So, brothers and sisters, that is God's dream for us. That is God's dream for the churches, for all of us, for Christians. What's the second principle? God's dream is for us. He redeemed us so that He can redeem a bride for His Son. Let's get back to loving God. The simplicity of loving God again. And not loving pleasure, you know the convenience of modern days can either be a curse or blessing. 
Of course, the technological advances are very good. Oh, it makes us feel cool. We have aircon. It makes us feel comfortable in a sunny day. But it can also be a curse. You know, Christians cannot worship, cannot come to God if there's no aircon. You know, when things are so difficult, I have to do this, do that. They don't want to come to, to the church anymore because we are being pampered by the modern conveniences. And churches continue to pamper people. There's coffee in church. There's snacks in church. That's why we go. We are lovers of pleasure. If the church doesn't serve coffee or pleasure, I don't want to go to church. But in another part of the world, people go to church fearing if they go there, whether they will be caught, whether they, it will mean that the police will catch them and they will be murdered the next moment. Do we see the reality of what we are going through? Are we, are we being so blinded to what is going on with our lives? Many years ago, I was in Indonesia in a place where they brought us to a place and we had to be transported to another, to another car. We were sent to a house and we have to go through another house to reach to another meeting place because they were fearing that they will be noticed by the authorities. Authorities will catch Christians who gather at home. So people were fearful. There are parts of the world where people are fearful to gather, to even together to seek God, to worship God together. But we are so concerned. Ah, not convenient, no, nothing to please me, I don't want to go. So brothers and sisters, let's wake up, let's get the main things, main thing in our life. The second principle, God redeemed us to be his bride. Let's return to the simplicity of just loving God for who he is, for how he loves us and just for who he is. Not just always loving him for what he can do for me, what he can give me, how answer he can bring to me. Brothers and sisters, let's come back to the simplicity of loving God for who He is. The third principle, like I promised, just three simple principles for you to ponder throughout this week and the times to come is like what Jesus has said, love God and love your neighbor. The third principle is about loving others. God's dream is also not just for ourselves, it's for the up for the outside world as well. So the Great Commission is also very important, right? It is all included in the second commandment to love the neighbors as we love ourselves. But right in the verse that we read in 2 Timothy just now, we are told that not only are we lovers of pleasure in the last days, we will also be lovers of ourselves and we will be lovers of money. When we just love ourselves, when we love money, we will not be able to understand and appreciate the third principle that is to love others. Brothers and sisters, remember this. We love people, but we use money. We never turn this in the opposite direction. We cannot use people and love money. That is not correct. God asks us, to love others. It is something for us to learn. It doesn't come automatic to us. God placed different people in our lives for us to learn to love. This is part of God's dream for us. When we learn to love, He builds us. He transforms us. He makes us to become like His Son. We are not to love ourselves. If we are so consumed with just our concern, our anxiety of ourselves, our needs, we will forget about others. But God has placed us wherever we are because his dream for us is also about others. And he wants us to learn to love others. Not just to love ourselves, not just loving money. These are the things that will become very prominent in the last days. Not what I say, but what is written in the scripture. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of themselves, and lovers of money. We've got to get rid of all these. We've got to make it very clear. Check our heart. Examine our, our, our heart. Oh, I'm loving myself more than loving others. I'm loving money more than loving others. I use people I don't love people, but I love money. So all these, we got to get it clear. 
in our hearts, in our mind, in our lives. Not later, but now. Now is the time we got to truly understand what is God's dream for each one of us. Stop pursuing any dream that is inconsistent with God's dream for you and for me. This is the question that God asks each one of us today. What is God's dream for you? Are you pursuing God's dream He has for you? Are you pursuing your own things? If you are doing your own things, beware. In the times of shaking come, all that will be shake, can be shaken will be shaken. That which cannot be shaken will remain. God's dream will not be shaken. If you are living in God's dream, you will be in a firm foundation. Hallelujah. I pray that the words that we share today is a blessing to all of you. You take time to ponder these things. We need to take time to reflect on these things uh, time and again. May the Holy Spirit bring remind, remembrance and to remind us of these things because this is precious to Him. This is His dream for you and for me so that we do not go off focus. We do not pursue the wrong thing and we do not fall in times of shaking. Brothers, brothers and sisters, shall we take this time to pray? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning that you have given us, Lord. You're a good father and you want us to know what is in your heart. You ask us, do we know your dreams for each one of us? Father, in these three simple keys and principles, may we take time to ponder over them. Father, even right now, we welcome the Holy Spirit to minister to every heart. Begin to speak in a still small voice in our hearts today, Lord. Lord, bring conviction to our hearts. If we are already, if we have gone astray, bring us back to you, Lord. Gently, Lord, with your hand, begin to realign our lives, shift our focus back to you. Lord. Father, just like Apostle Paul learned to do, he learns to forget the things which are behind because those things could not help him to fulfill your dream for him rather he pressed on towards the dream that you have for him so lord i pray you speak to the your children this day brothers and sisters if the holy spirit begins to show you the things these hindrances in your lives let them go forget these things give it to god release it to god forget them and tell god you want to once again rebuild your life realign your lives you may have gone there may be many disappointments there may be discouragements people may have done the wrong thing people may have hurt you let them go these things if you keep it if you keep it and you keep on holding them holding to them in your hands these things can help you to fulfill God's dream for you. Release them to God. And begin today to tell God, I want to reprioritize my life. I want to refocus my life, Lord. I want to build my life where you are the focus. You are the central. You are the main thing. And all that I do, my life it was created for you, O oh God. Forgive me. If all these lives is has been about other things. It's never been about you. You are just an accessory. You are just a small part in my life. Forgive me, Lord. Bring conviction to my heart, Lord. Awaken my heart, Lord. Let me know this is your dream. You want to be that place in my life. To be the first place, to be the highest place. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Be the main thing in my life. Come, Lord Jesus. Let me begin today to learn to love you. Let me begin to take steps to learn to love you. That to return to the simplicity of loving you for who you are. Not just always to seek things for myself. Oh, to ask that God, you do this for me, you do that for me. But Lord, I've forgotten that you have sent your son not 
to redeem a group of ungrateful people, not to redeem a group of people who only knows how to ask things and complain, but to redeem a bride, one who loves you. Lord, make us lovers of God. Not just doing many things, but not being able to love your word, to obey you, to do the things you want us to do. Forgive us, Lord. We can be busy with so many things, but in doing all these things, we must question ourselves. Am I doing out of love for God? Or just to promote myself? Or just to make myself known? Or just to bring pleasure to myself? These are not, all these motivations do not show that I love you. Forgive me, Lord. This day, give, me, give us the grace to learn to love you, Lord. To learn to love others. People that you put in our lives, Lord, we choose to release forgiveness. We choose to walk in love. We choose to be walking in patience. Lord. To love is to be patient. To choose to love is a deliberate choice. It's an intentional decision to go against my fleshly tendency. I choose to obey you. I choose to love you. I choose to love others. Father, stretch forth your hand today. Father, I pray that you bless every brother and sister. Release fresh grace to all of us. We can live in these perilous times, in the last days, building our lives on the right foundation, knowing what is truly your dream for us, what is truly in your heart for us, O oh God. Turn our lives towards you. We, let your people return to you to love you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Commit all people into your hands youngest to the oldest everyone Lord, bless them bless them Lord. release your grace upon them the multitude in the multitude of your mercies speak to them bless them Lord. thank you Lord. that's all this in jesus name hallelujah praise the lord god bless all of you you continue to walk in the ways of God and to fulfill God's dream for you. God bless.